Hey, would you like to try a micro marriage with me? <laughs> it's, no, don't worry. It's really casual. It's fine. <laughs> Here's what I think happens when people get this question. They end up saying stuff like you did, micro marriage. Hello, and welcome to Why Are We Talking About Rabbits? That's this podcast aimed at folks like you, or maybe not. Maybe you got it all figured out. Uh, if you do, you can yeah, well, you can click out right now. But if you don't, you probably feel a deep sense of dislocation from time to time. We talk about those heavy things on this show, but we do it lightly. Theology, history, philosophy, years of deeply immersive experiences is what we use to figure out what the heck is going on. So today, on episode 35, we take a look at the Latin phrase, proficimus more irritante, and what it means for your dating life. This is Watar. This is episode 35. Hey, what's happening? Uh, it's good to see everybody. Today's show brings us the wonderful and Quite lovely talents of our producer, Andrew Schwartz, former First Things field worker, current work. Well, you, you work for us all the time, and you're in Russia. Say hi, Andrew. How you doing? Uh, a big snowy hello from here it's, in Ufa. It's in, by the way, you live in Ufa in Russia. Yeah, Ufa. UFA. So the, mod the modern world, the new worlders have brought us the ability for you to edit and produce this show from Ufa. That is correct. Just say Ufa. It's funny. Ufa. I don't think people in Russia who live in Ufa think it's funny, though. They probably. <laughs> no, I think they're like, that's just a name. <laughs> Why are you right making it more than it is? <laughs> right now they're like, this guy's in Greenville. <laughs> Greenville, funny. All right. That is my Russian accent, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, you want to talk about this proficimus more irritante? Let's do it. First I of all, really do. Uh, what is it? Uh, what does it mean? You're going to have to <laughs> translate that. So let's start with the Latin. That proficimus more irritante, it means we make progress unhindered by custom. We make progress unhindered by custom. And I was thinking about this. Latin phrase today after listening to one of my favorite podcasts by Malcolm Gladwell. That podcast is called Revisionist History. If you listen to that podcast, you know that it's top notch. I think so anyway. So as the story goes, uh, and you can find the podcast in our pod notes, Andrew will put it up there for you. The pod episode is called Bomber Mafia. In the story, we get to know a general named Curtis LeMay who is a deep and profound lover of flight, all things flight and all things, as it turns out, warfare. And one of the things he tries to promote in his lifetime, Curtis LeMay, is a vision of what the Air Force can become. He's doing this in the early 20th century, right? So 100 years ago, when flight's just becoming a thing, he sees this whole vision for what the Air Force can become and what air war can become. And it becomes something that we know today is the Strategic Air Command, which is basically, right, the folks responsible for the maintenance of our capacity to drop nuclear bombs on people. That aside, whether that's bad or good, a lot of people argue that's good, right? In the history of warfare, they say that it's, it's created fewer wars, not, not more. But anyway, leaving that aside, LeMay, in lots of ways, really is the father of warfare taking place in the air. And he loved bombers, big bombers. He helped design and perfect those big B-52s, right? The things that would deliver extremely accurate payloads, deadly payloads, right on top of your head. And he wasn't afraid to change things up, right, in terms of air, air warfare. But his love was for these bombers and changing up warfare for him meant becoming super accurate. He 
eventually got to firebombing as the way to go. And if you look at firebombing in Japan and Germany during World War II, he's responsible for most of it. Because what he saw is that dropping a single bomb wasn't as effective as dropping a firebomb that was made out of what we know now as napalm. LeMay is the father of napalm. And why am I telling you all this? Because, you see, LeMay had a certain outlook on life, summed up by this quote that he, he spoke these words uh, during his tenure as one of our greatest Air Force generals, right? And you can actually see him being depicted in a movie called Strategic Air Command, and he is Jimmy Stewart, by the way, Jimmy Stewart's the same guy who starred in Wonderful Life. Do you ever see that, Andrew? Uh, every Christmas I watch that. And now and so he's, he's yeah. also a general. I just can't imagine that. I can't square that in my head. <laughs> Let me clarify. Jimmy Stewart is an actor who pretends to be other people. In the movie Strategic Air Command, he's pretending to be Curtis <laughs> <Lane>. <laughs> It's It's not Jimmy Stewart playing... What's the guy's name? Uh, and oh, that character is not pretending to be General Curtis LeMay. Jimmy Stewart is. What you need to know is that Curtis LeMay was such a character in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s that they made four movies essentially where his character shows up. Four movies about him in some way. He's the kind of big deal, right? That, well, it's the kind of big deal that makes him a bit uh, of a bad guy in Hollywood during the 50s and 60s. George Bailey. Thank you. George Bailey is Jimmy Stewart's character in It's a Wonderful Life, but George Bailey does not show up in Strategic Air Command. Nor does he firebomb the small town he lives in. <laughs> no, he <laughs> redeems the small town. Through, through redemption of his own soul. I need a sound effect right there. Badoom ching. So here's the deal. This is what I want to really get to today. So LeMay, after all of that, all of his famousness, he had a simple black and white rule for war. Quote, he, this is what he says. Once you make a decision to use military force to solve your problem, then you ought to use it and you ought to use an overwhelming amount of military force. Use too much and deliberately use too much so that you don't make an error on the other side and end up not having enough, unquote. This is a variation on total war. You can argue that LeMay brought total war to the air. And making sure that you have plenty of cutting edge explosive devices, things like napalm bombs and thermite bombs and seismic bombs, he created those, and hydrogen bombs. And while all these bombs was LeMay's way of shouting out, proficamus more irritante. We are going to make the best bombs progress and we're going to do it unhindered by custom. What, just a quick side note. Yeah. Is custom before LeMay restrained? Like, is yeah. he breaking right. convention because he's just going over the top? Yeah. One of the customs of European warfare anyway was, hey, try not to kill non-combatants. Right, that comes out of the just war theory that was, you know, a thousand years old. And so... This is very important that people hear this. The just war theory, okay, didn't mean that everybody obeyed it. It was an ideal of war. Now, some people were saying, but isn't war just about killing people? No, it was always about winning and politics and power, but it was always about doing it in some way that led to some honor. And for most Europeans anyway, the argument was, is you got to reserve some honor even in war. And really, the American Civil War is one of the first wars where that gets put to the side. And civil wars usually see a lot of this kind of activity. But by LeMay's time, 70 years later, right, he's got to decide how to create this air force, and he applies proficamus more irritante. And that, Andrew, leads me to dating. <laughs> Incredible. But of course, <laughs> how does it lead to dating? <laughs> well, what is dating? 
You want to take a shot? Uh, You're married, right? I Yes, I am married. And the next question is easy to answer to a Russian because that's why you live in Ufa. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> okay. Did you date the two of you? Oh, uh, yes. What was it? It being dating. It being dating. Uh, a series of micro marriages with short term <laughs> absences. I don't know. I don't know what it was. <laughs> Dude, that I want to. Can we write that on the board behind me? A series of micro marriages. That is one of the most brilliant. So I've written here in my little watar script that i bet you can't define it even if you tried and you did but i don't know anyone that's ever going to use that definition of dating hey would you <laughs> like to try a micro marriage with me <laughs> it's, no don't worry it's really casual it's fine <laughs> here's what i think happens when people get this question they end up saying stuff like you did micro marriage uh dating is trying out a person to see if they're good for marriage which it's kind of like, I don't know, like taking a used car out for a ride and seeing if you really want to buy it, right? Because that's not the greatest description. Or maybe you say something like, dating is learning all about yourself while learning about love, too. And then you'd have to add something like, at the expense of the person you're having sex with. There's, there's, <laughs> a, there's, there's a lot in dating that's confusing, right? Even when you date and don't have sex then dating, spending time with someone that you really like, but that could be your buddies you play hoops with. But, you, because you're not having sex with them either. But they're not, guy, you know, you know, if you're a, a heterosexual, then there's something about the woman that makes them dateable because you want to have sex with them. Is that what makes them your dating friend instead of your hoops friend. You see, look, what I'm trying to say is, is dating is really confusing. And I think the answer is, is dating is whatever I want it to be. And that seems true to me, but what does this have to do with proficamus more irritante or sticky bombs or whatever? What has it got to do with it? Well, let me quote from a podcast I recently heard. I think it'll help. And just so you know, Andrew, I was listening to this podcast as a type of research. I'm not generally a dating podcast kind of guy. I don't like subscribe. I'll, I'll just take you at your word on that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling the truth on this one. Here's the deal. I was recently listening to a dating podcast called Landing Your Man. So you can find that. Shout out to them. Uh, it's in the pod notes. Uh, and in Landing Your Man, the host was trying, on this particular episode, was trying to describe dating. And she says, quote, My mom's good friend, who does a lot of weddings for people, when she, oh, sorry, when he marries people, he doesn't say, quote, till death do you part. He says, until this union is meant to end, unquote. Now, she's describing what her, good, her mom's good friend does, who he stands in as a pastor, or whatever, an online, he's a, you know, he's a marriage coach that has a certificate, and then he comes and he marries people. And it's, it's, it, he says, until this union is meant to end, right? Now, as a part-time officiate of weddings, she then tells her guest that this podcaster says, quote, sometimes you're not supposed to be with someone forever. It's supposed to be for as long as it rides out. So they're trying to talk about what marriage is as a way to define what dating is. And it's super interesting that they seem at that point almost the same. There's no permanence now, we all know you can get divorced, but they're not trying to set marriage apart in terms of permanence. What they're saying is all relationships might need to end. So I bring this up not as a way to, to deride the podcasters. They're, they're, they have a nice show. It's, it's not derisive to have a viewpoint on marriage. 
or on dating. It's human. Just have one. It's okay. But I bring this up because if you think about it, LeMay's view about bombing things and landing your man's podcast view of dating things, they're really close in construction. Both are very proficimus more irritante. Progress unhindered by custom. If you think about it, right, what these ladies were not doing on Landing Your Man was trying to reach into some past in order to pull out an obedience. They're simply going with progress unhindered by custom. They're not trying to attend to some tradition being passed down. They're trying to be obedient to their moment, for better or worse. Remember, this show is about illuminating new world, old world. And that handing down thing is really old. The rules, if you will, they come to LeMay, and they come to land in your man as a type of holy advice. Do this. Trust me, it's better for everybody. Curtis LeMay, General LeMay, do this. Try not to kill combatants, non-combatants. It's better for everybody. Landing your man. Try to do this thing called courting. It's just better for everybody. But in our modern world, in the new world, customs, right? Dating rules in history are all about the avoidance of pain. And we're going to talk about it right now. Things that come down through the pipe generation to generation, they are attempts to get you, Andrew, the single guy who was dating Victoria at one point, they're trying to get you out of the pain realm and into a positive realm. The problem is it comes with all these right prohibitions. Right, Dating rules like rules of war are road signs. They're meant to assist human beings in their very human activities. In LeMay's case, he was passing a very important road sign. A customary rule handed down in various European theaters of war for a millennium. And here's what the sign said. Don't harm non-combatants. It was a rule of thumb for war. LeMay skirted the rule. But even more importantly, he obliterated it. He took the rule, the sign on the side of the road, and he melted that thing down and put it into one of his bombs. <laughs> he turned the red light into a green light. Right? Yikes. And that's what he did. Now, I'm cool. That's This isn't judgment about what he did, but it's an illumination. It's a point of interest when it comes to our pod. And we can say the same thing about dating today, at least about the kind of advice given by most dating coaches, I think. Land your man type advice. The customary rules for dating have all been melted down. Proficuous more irritante is the way to go. We will not be hindered by the customs in the dating world. And that brings me, obviously, to the Kama Sutra. Oh, another <laughs> fantastic segue, John. Is that, uh, that's not obvious to you that we're going to an Indian sex guide manual? Well, I was thinking something more like <laughs> there was like some sort of bomb cleverness there. Like, uh, you know, melting these things down has, fa there's fallout or something. Oh, I like that. Um, but no, we're not doing that. Oh, okay. All right. Please continue. <laughs> no, here's why the Kama Sutra, man, we... It, this is where everybody, it's like my mom right now is just, just literally searching her <laughs> podcast device for the off button. And her like phone just fell to the ground. She's like, oh God. I'm not sure she would even know what the Kama Sutra is. I think she would just think that sounds bad. But the Kama Sutra, man, check it out. If you know the words Kama Sutra, okay, you probably saw some pics or something when you were young or of some colorful ancient people like doing sex stuff. And if you're really good, like in the modern American way, you probably think Kama Sutra is like a, a sex manual for hippies. Did you have that thought? Would you be in that space? I was before. Yes, I would be definitely in that space. Like, do you think the Kama Sutra is for Hare Krishna people who want to know how to have sex? Uh, no, I think the Kama Sutra is more for like curious teenagers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just porn, basically. It's not. <laughs> yeah. It's not. It's not. But it's weird. 
And I'm going to tell you how weird it is and how it all applies. Let's do it. Let's do it. You want to do it? Let's do it. Be a piece. Okay. The Kama Sutra is not a crazy sex manual for wanton hitchhikers. It's actually a sacred text. It's actually, right? The Sutra is the wisdom. It's, it's, It's pearls. It's pearls. It means, it means a string of pearls, literally. There's all kinds of sutras. There's, all, there's, there's different types of wisdom pearls. And the pearls of wisdom, you guys have heard that, the pearls of wisdom are strung together in holy text. And what, what they lead you to is some sort of really good way to live your life. So kama here is sex or, sex or sensual love sutra. It's the pearls of wisdom when it comes to sensual love. And it's in holy books. And its purpose, check this out, is to pass down custom. Mm. The advice of the ages passed down. It's a type of yield sign when talking about, say, how to land your man. See, but here's where I think uh, modern teenagers, myself, we get caught up with the sexual side, but it I have a feeling you're about to tell me that there's there's a whole other side to this Kama Sutra, which is not just... Sexy part. Yeah, right. Well, most of it is referring to sex. There's also, there's the um, uh, the Kama Shastra, which is a little bit of a different document. But all of it is essentially trying to explain to young people, like... Young here, mean, meaning pre-married, but mostly post-married young people. Remember, people getting married very early in ancient India. It's just trying to explain to them, hey, here's what sex is about. Here's how it works. And here's not only how you should do it, but it's like why it's in your life. And so for a Puritan West, right, what are we getting passed down for you know, 300 years, we're getting passed down a very, very, very empty manual about this. Where we're getting it passed down at all, it's privately and it's in words. But we don't have a lot of that in Holy Script, but we have a lot of that in Holy Tradition. The words do come down to us, especially in the Eastern Christianity. You can find out about this stuff if you listen carefully what the church says. But the thing is, is it's not written. It's just written here. It's written and it's explicit and it is about like sex positions even at times, but it's not only about that. Let me try to explain. Okay. It's a manual and it's, this is really important. It's for people once they are married. The rest of the manual is for what families should do in order to get the right marriage. But the actual parts of sex are for you when you're married Right, This keep your mate thing is deeply embedded in the Kama Sutra. And it's embedded in the old world. Because guess what? Contrary to popular belief, Andrew, marriage is confusing and difficult and complicated and often unwanted and a pain in the butt even in the old world, especially in the old world. Marriage was always hard. And it's hard today. And so the Kama Sutra is a like, well, let me try to help you understand just how hard this is. And guess what? Because being married is hard for human people with human bodies, ancient traditions tried to address this thing and they wrote and talked about it. And here's what's really cool. One of the things they talked about was sex. Because guess what? One of the things that makes marriage marriage is that you do plan to have sex with the person you're married to. (laughs) I think people forget this. I think they don't fully understand that one of the demarcating lines, one of the demarcations of a married person is that now they're having sex. Well, hold on, John. I don't know if that's the case. I think the modern, the modern mind, right? Yeah. Uh, And the way that I thought of it was, well, it's like, how do I know if I'm sexually compatible? I should be having sex before marriage to know if I should get married. (laughs) Let me ask you, do you think that's a commonly held 20 something concept? I think a lot of people have that idea. Yeah, I do too. Here's a quote. And it goes right to this idea. This is a quote from the Kama Sutra quote, in accordance with the precepts of Holy writ. Okay. And the, the Kama Sutra is speaking 
as a, a holy pearl of wisdom, right? It's a road sign. It continues, quote, the results of a union that follows these customs in this holy sutra, right? The results are the acquisition of Dharma and Arthra, offspring, love, an increase of friends, and untarnished sexual joy. So I'm going to say it again, right? In accordance with the precepts of this holy pearl of wisdom, the results of a marriage done properly and according to custom are the acquisition of Dharma, Arthra. Dharma is like, it's, it's goodness. It's, it's, it's that which, it's your reward. Arthra, which is like soulfulness, offspring, children, affinity, a type of love, increase of friends, untarnished sexual joy. That's what marriage is for, right? Those are the outcomes of the Holy Union. So the first thing we notice about the Kama Sutra is that there's a purpose to your union. You're not doing it for, I don't know, your own purposes. It has an actual outcome. It has telos, it has purpose, and, and it has an end. In the case, in this case, the, the purpose of the union is to acquire Dharma and Arthra and the other things. And here's the second part that speaks directly to your 20-something comment about um, don't I want to know if I'm compatible? Okay. We see that sex is a part of marriage. And here's what the road sign says. It says that folks who get intimate are getting intimate, and this is really important, so they can learn how to love. And this means you have to have time on task. And so one of the types of love that marriage is supposed to give you is what they call habitual love, the love created from habit. And sex is meant to be practiced in this tradition if within marriage, not because it feels good or because of anything, but because by doing it in a practical way on the regular and for a long period of committed time, a union called marriage, out of the practice will come love. And so if you keep going, right, the continual habit, in this case, the habit of having sex, what it does is it habituates love. Quote, Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. You got a question. Yeah, quick question. So the presupposition here makes it sound like love is not present to begin with, which is sort of antithetical to, I guess, a new world perspective on why you get married, because I'm in love. <laughs> Correct. So, right. This is really important. The new world perspective is, is I want the love before I enter the marriage. Yes. And so people start to practice sex, right? Check this out. This is from the Kama Sutra, right? S quote, sexual intercourse is given to the married couple as something constant and continual. Married sex allows a couple to appreciate the act by acquiring the practice of it. And in so doing, the couple acquires a love of sex, but more importantly, a love of one another. And that's what everybody's trying to do once they get together. The difference is, is in marriage, you are united in this crazy, permanent, eternal way, which means I'm going to have somebody to practice with. So when you think about it, it's a little bit like what your mom told you. My mom told me this for sure. My dad too. Remember when you didn't want to go to baseball practice? Yeah, actually. <laughs> or whatever practice you were put in as a little kid. Your parents made you go because they knew that if you practiced enough, if you practiced the craft, there would probably be some sort of love of the game, right? Doing becomes being. And so if you keep going with the concept, marriage, marriage is sex practice. Right now, what about the folks who practice a lot of sex before marriage? Well, the Kama Sutra makes it pretty clear that they can't achieve Dharma and Arthur because they won't have the practice time dedicated into eternity. They'll run out of time. 
and we know this happens, you can see it happen all the time, is that couples start to think of sex differently when they're doing it before marriage, right? And what happens is, is it tends to lead to an end of the relationship unless there's something else there. Now, do I think people can practice sex, grow into marriage and stay uh, stay together without actually being married in some kind of way? I think so. But I think what the, the Kama Sutra would say, and, and most holy traditions would say, there needs to be some promise of eternity or at least life. Some lengthy promise. Otherwise, the sex becomes something it shouldn't be, which is really a consumption of, of, an, of, a, of an event rather than a, a type of union, a type of unification and a type of practice towards something beautiful. And I think that's what's going on. Just to finish the metaphor, Andrew, going into marriage, long-term, committed, having sex, is like playing the game its entirety. The other way is like being a DH. Showing up, hitting every three innings, maybe hitting a home run, things are going pretty good, but never fully participating in the entirety of what is the beautiful game of baseball. And that's just the way ancient Hindus understand it. Right, and here's one more thing from the old world that's really nutty. <laughs> this maybe is even too nutty, but you want to <laughs> do it? Let's do it. So far, the Kama Sutra is a custom passed down, and it's passed down as road signs and as advice, right? In other words, it's not proficamus more irritante. It's not progress unhindered by custom. It's life dedicated to custom, which can be very difficult to do. Part of the custom was to explain to people who your best partner was, who your best match is. Just like on the show, Land Your Man, they were talking about how do you know who's the right guy? Well, one of the ways you knew, at least in ancient India, was who was the family you were becoming involved with? And more importantly, what type of family right? What type of family was the man's, was the man coming from? And what type of woman was the, what type of family was the woman coming from? And in this case, they did not mean class, religion. They actually meant, was the man you're about to get involved with a hair man, a bull man, or a horse man? (laughs) (laughs) And these are all, of course, natural metaphors for size. Ah. Not just of your private parts, but in general of the person. Tall, bony, burly. And guess what? The women were deer women, mare women, elephant women. And so one of the things you knew about yourself growing up, this is ancient India now. In modern India, this has changed a great deal. But in ancient India, one of the things you knew was what kind of family you came from, what kind of bone structure you had. It was actually had names. And so one of the things that the Kama Sutra was teaching is, is what type of body you should also get with. It's nuts, right? Hmm. I kind of like what it type though. Of, yeah. I mean, it was prescribed right down to, no, no, you're an elephant woman. You must not marry the hair man. You'll squash them. Here, here being rabbit. Yeah, you'll squash them. <laughs> Bad match. Bad match. And, and for those of you who are saying, that is the creepiest thing I've ever heard. No, it's, I just sit around and listen to my own family. Four daughters talk about men. They don't want the short man. Wait, and, and isn't matchmaking a thing? I mean, this is like matchmaking just with like regulations and like, like it's, it's, more formalized, I guess. It's not as informal as it is today, but this yeah. seems like, I don't know, okay Cupid a thousand years ago. Like, yeah, you're not a good match. That's true. Now, here's the thing. I think matchmakers are making a comeback in part because of proficimus more irritante. People realize they can't do it right on their own. The matchmaker becomes a stand-in for the family tradition. Oh. The matchmaker is not going to tell you you're a hair man. So get a deer woman, but they're going to use terms 
that like, no, he's not right for you. And then if you start digging around, you start to realize part of that is the physical match. Now, just watch out, mom, on this one. A lot of the Kama Sutra is actually about the parts, the size of the guy, the size of the woman, right? And it gets really detailed about just what kind of size. <laughs> <laughs> and it's nutty, but what it is, is it's like custom on steroids. Now, we know in the new world, this is going to get off the rails, right? Because auntie's going to come in and go, this, you're never going to, you're not allowed to marry the bull man because you're a, a dear woman. That's not happening. We're a bull family. This is a wrong match. And for us in the new world, we're like, this is oppressive. And it is oppressive, but the signposts are meant to do something, right? The Holy Writ in this case, is meant for your edification. And the next question you have to ask is, is it true or is it helpful? And Proficimus More Irritante says, I don't care if it's helpful. I'm not using it. I'm doing whatever I feel like doing because I want the results the way I want them. And that's interesting. Scientifically, can we get divorce rates a thousand years ago? <laughs> Because maybe that'll tell us, is it, is it working? <laughs> so this is really great. There's a lot of work done on that. And, you know, the divorce rates are so, so, so low. Even in India today, you know, the divorce rates are really low because a lot of this tradition still is still hanging on. But what happened in the 70s in the United States is, is perficamus more irritante. People just started to re reinvent well, they didn't reinvent custom. What they did is they became their own customizers. They became the center of their decision-making process. They cut out their families and they cut out, you know, religious tradition. And you know what? I think a lot of people might be happier for it, but maybe the jury's out. I think the jury is still out. So... Hopefully my mom will still talk to me after I brought up lingam and yonis. <laughs> <laughs> the yoni goes with the woman and the lingam goes with the man. But I think heavy things done lightly, I do think in the end though, that the heavy thing here is 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 what does it mean to be to obey and what should you obey? And the, then the flip side is is what does it mean to make decisions on your own? Ha. Like at the core of that, what is that? What actually are you relying on? You know, like, is it just your experience? What was LeMay relying on? And you, he'll tell you what he's relying on. He was, he was relying on science. He believed in the technological aspects of the airplane to overcome and overwhelm all the other aspects of war. He believed in the airplane itself and in the bomb. And so it's kind of cool. Perficamus more irritante. Thanks to Malcolm Gladwell for that. And thank you guys for tuning in. Shenny's Gagi Marjos. Andrew, you know what that is. Uh, that is to you, the victory. That's right, man. And that's said at the KP table, which is sometimes called a supra. And the supra is old fashioned, and there's lots of rules at that thing. And you should invite us to come throw one in your town because we do that. There also would be a wonderful thing for you to do is tune in to one of our pod courses. You can find those on our website. You can find what we do, which is we do long-term immersion style poverty alleviation programs. We're in Appalachia and other places around the world like Guatemala and Sierra Leone right now. One of our buddies, Jake. Hi, Jake. Just got pulled out of his site because there was a Ebola outbreak. Not too far from him. But this is First Things Foundation I'm talking about. And this is Watar. Why are we talking about rabbits? Keep tuning in. Hit us up with good, really cool, uh, um, what do we call them, Andrew? It's Reviews? Called, yeah, it's called a review. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks for producing the show and telling me what review means. And uh, you guys should hit those up. Take a look out. we got some cool, cool guests coming. And to all of you, Gagi March.